Hello everybody and welcome to the first part of my particle effect tutorial. Now in this first part I'm just going to talk about actually spawning in the particles and the method call that will be used to spawn in the particles. Now here on screen you can see the method call that will actually spawn in our particle. There are two ways to use it. You can either call the spawn particle method on a world object or you can call it on a player object. If you call it on a world object it will display the particle to all of the players on the server. And if you call it on a player object, it will only display it to that particular player. And now, this method call will take in a handful of parameters. First of all, you have to give it a particle, which will be the particle you're going to spawn. The next one will be a location object, which will be the location that the particle will actually spawn at. Alternatively, you can also give it a double x, y, and z coordinate. And that will be the position the particle will spawn at. And then the next parameter will be the number of particles that will spawn. And then you have a handful of optional particles. First you have the offset, which will be a x, y, and z offset. And this will just be a rectangular volume around the point the particle will be spawning at. And the particle will be able to spawn randomly anywhere within that volume. And you'll just be able to set the volume of that offset by changing the offset x, y, and z values. Uh, if you want the particle to just spawn exactly at the location you specify, you can either just exclude these parameters entirely, or you could just set them to be zero either way. And then on top of that, you can also just throw in some uh, additional data parameters. For example, we have some colored particles later on where we'll have to pass in an additional object but this is basically the gist of the particle spawning method call. And now I like to think of there being two different types of particles, and I call them directional particles and static particles. Directional particles are basically particles that spawn at a specific position, and then you can specify a direction vector that the particles will shoot at. And a static particle is basically just a particle that spawns at the location and it does not move until it eventually disappears. And you can see just a couple of examples of each of these particles here. I just have one example that just creates an individual particle. And then I created a couple of example particle effects that just show off each of these types of particles. And now in order to actually spawn in these directional particles, we have to do a few things to our spawn particle method. First off, we have to make sure we have the count set to zero, and then we will have our x, y, and z offset, and we'll use this to actually create the directional vector that is going to be the direction that the particle is going to be moving in. Now, one way to think of this is if you have your origin at zero, 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 and then you create another coordinate at this x, y, and z offset variable location, uh, and you just create a line that moves from the origin at 0, 0 to that point, that is going to be the directional vector. And you can kind of see that visualized in this little image here at the bottom, where basically you just start at your origin, and then you have your offset in the x-axis, your offset in the y-axis, and then your offset in the z-axis, and then just create a line that shoots off in that direction and that is going to be the final direction vector. And uh, finally, your last parameter will also be your speed, or the speed that the particle will travel. Just one thing to keep in mind is this is more of a multiplier of the particle's default speed. So if you were to have one particle where you set the speed to 1, which is pretty much the default speed, and you have another particle where you set the speed to be 1, they are not going to be uniform speeds. They're going to be just the default speed for whatever that individual particle is. So that's just something that is worth keeping in mind. And now here you can just see a list of all the directional particles that you can actually give a direction to. Uh, there's a lot more particles that exist, but these are the only ones that you can actually assign a direction to. And now we also have colored particles. Now there are a handful of different color particles where you can assign a red, green, and blue value to it, but they all work a little bit different, so I'm just going to go into each one individually. So first off, we had redstone, and in order to create a redstone particle, uh, first you have to create a dust options object, and you just do this by creating a new dust options object. It takes in a color. Uh, you can just do color dot from RGB, and then you'll be able to give it an RGB value. 
Uh, you could just find any RGB color picker online to get an idea for what values create what color. Uh, so that's fairly straightforward. And then you also have to give it a size. And the default size is one, but you can increase that or decrease it to uh, create whatever size you want. And then when you do your spawn particle method call, you just want to be sure that you include that dust options object at the very end of that. And that is pretty much the gist of the redstone particle. Like if you want to create a red redstone particle, you would just set the R to be 255, the G and B to be zero, so on and so forth. Uh, but all of those RGB values are between 0 and 255. And then similar to this redstone one, you have this dust color transition. This basically starts off as one color and then fades to another color. Uh, this is very similar, but instead of creating a dust options object, you create a dust transition object. And then that one's actually going to take in two colors instead of one, where the first color will be the initial color and the second one will be the final color. And along with the redstone uh, spawn particle method call, you just want to make sure you include that dust transition object as a uh, parameter at the very end of that method call. And we also have the spell mob and spell mob ambient particles. This one works a little bit different because we don't create some kind of dust options object. We just are going to give it the RGB values directly in the X, Y, and Z offset parameters, where the X offset is going to be the red, the Y offset is going to be the green, and the Z offset is going to be the blue. And another thing to keep in mind is instead of being between 0 and 255, it's actually going to be between 0 and 1. So if you wanted to have a red particle, you would set the red X offset to be 1 and the green and blue to be 0. And similarly, if you want a green or blue particle. And besides that, the only thing is uh, you still have to have the count to be equal to 0. You can only spawn one of these particles at a time. And you also want to include uh, that 1 at the very end. Uh, as a parameter for that spawn particle method call as well. And another cool thing we can do is we can actually create custom colored note particles. With our spawn particle method call, what we're going to do is we're going to have to set the count to be equal to zero. We're going to set the x offset parameter to be our note value. So now we have this nice table on the left that tells us the uh, dx value that is actually associated with every single note color. So for example, if you wanted a red C note, you would set the dx to be 0.25, or alternatively you could do 6 divided by 24. They both get you 0.25, but uh, with our spawn particle method call, we're going to have to have uh, the y and z offset parameters to be 0. And we also want to tack on that one at the very end of that uh, spawn particle method call as well. And that is pretty much the gist of how you spawn in different colored note particles. You just want to make sure you have that x offset note value to be between 0 and 1. And now finally we also have material particles where we can actually assign a material to a particle and that'll change the particle that's actually being displayed. So uh, there are two different types of material particles. We have block material particles where you have to give it a solid block object. And we have item crack, which you can give it any material pretty much. So for the block crack, block dust, and falling dust, you have to give it a block material. Uh, the way you can double check it's a block material is if you do material dot whatever material dot is block, it will return true. And as long as it returns true, you can use it as a block material in these particular block particles. So what we have to do for this is we just have to create a block data object. And then with that, we just assign it a materials dot create block data. And then there you have your block data for a particular material. And you can just take that block data and put it as a parameter at the very end of your spawn particle method call. And then similarly with item crack, you just don't have to have a solid block, so you could make this any material, but with our item crack, we want to actually create an item stack. And then we'll just set that item stack to be equal to a new item stack and give it whatever material you want it to be, whatever material you desire. And then you just take that item stack and insert that into the very end of your spawn particle method call as a parameter. And here's just a little example of what all of those look like. So with block 
crack, block dust, and falling dust. These all use the emerald block material. And then that item crack on the right just uses the emerald material. And so you can kind of just see the difference between all of the particles here. And now the final particle I'll be talking about, which uh, probably will be the least used and least useful for you in most instances. This is the vibration particle, which was introduced for pretty much the warden in the new update. But uh, there's two versions of this vibration particle. There's one where the particle will move towards an entity. Even if the entity moves around, it will still move towards the entity. And there's also a block variation where it will move either towards a block or a particular location. And now here you can actually see the method calls for both of these instances. First off at the top for moving the vibration particle towards an entity, uh, you just have to create a new vibration object. And this will take in an origin location, which will be where the vibration particle will start off at. And then you have to create a new entity destination where you give it the entity that you want it to follow. It doesn't necessarily have to be a player. It could be any kind of entity. There's a lot of different entities. Uh, and then finally, you also want to give it the number of ticks it will take for the particle to get from the origin location to the entity location. And then we're just going to take that vibration object and we're going to tack it on to the very end of our spawn particle method call. Nice and simple, nothing too crazy. In that spawn particle method, that origin location, I don't think it actually matters, so you can set it to anything, but just for filling in the gap sake, I usually just give it the same origin location that I put in the vibration game object. And then very similarly, uh, if we want to move it towards a block, you're just going to create a new vibration object. However, instead of giving it an entity destination, we're going to give it a block destination. And you can either give that an actual block object, or you can just give it a straight up location. But if you do give it a location, it's going to lock to the center of the block that it's in, which I believe is pretty much just a 0.5 for every single x, y, and z coordinate. It'll just lock it on to the 0.5 of every nearest 0.5 of every location. Uh, and then again, just give it that same number of ticks for it to get from the origin to the destination. And then you just want to attach that vibration object to the end of your spawn particle method call as a parameter. And that's essentially all of the particles that there are to spawn through the spawn particle method. Uh, there's also probably additional things you can do with it, and also alternate ways to spawn in particles like directly through packets. But everything that I'm going to show you in this tutorial series is just going to be directly through this spawn particle method call. And I'm just going to be using pretty much the same variations I've shown in this set of slides in this video. But that's basically all I have for you right now. I know this wasn't the most entertaining episode just because I'm showing you a lot of bits of code and boring slides and stuff. But in the next episode, I'm going to be showing you something more interesting, how to create a particle that goes from one point to another point, and then many variations of that and effects you can add to it. And I'll also get to some more interesting and impressive particles in later episodes. But I hope this helps you. I kind of just wanted to get into the nitty gritty of spawning particles just because I want you to be able to take the tutorial videos that I create and edit them and change them to fit whatever effect you want to create. So I hope this was helpful and I'll see you in the next episode.